My Lords, I would like to uh, start, if it's not an impertinence, to speak from this side of the House on this subject by associating myself as vigorously as I can with the remarks of the leader of my party, the Baroness Royal and the Baroness Dean, in condemning some of the things that are happening in other parts of the country today. Uh, I'm sure I was brought up, like many of your Lordships, under the rubric, under the golden rule, de mortuis nunes, nisi bonumis. And what is going on, I want to dissociate myself from and to say it has no part of my party uh, support. Secondly, uh, I would like to say before getting my main remarks is how I feel deeply for noble lords, mainly opposite, who served closely with Mrs. Thatcher in her cabinet and who served with her at number 10. And I, I know what it is to lose a friend and a leader, even uh, when they've left the leadership. And I can remember very vividly how desperate I felt when Harold Wilson died. And I do understand how colleagues opposite must feel terrible emotions at this time. And I want them to know that uh, they are understood on this side of the house. I'm now going, not unnaturally, to talk about something a little unfashionable about the late uh, Baroness, and that was her luck. She was a very, very lucky Prime Minister. She was a very, very lucky politician. Nothing wrong in that. Uh, I'm sure I'll be corrected by any historians among us, but I am told that uh, Whenever a name was put forward to Napoleon Bonaparte for promotion to general, his first question was, is he lucky? That's a very good question indeed. Baroness Thatcher was very lucky to say that is in no way to diminish her achievements and accomplishments. I want everybody in the house to understand that. But I mean, look what happened at the beginning. It was only because there wasn't a single man who was prepared to stand against Mr. Heath, whether on grounds of reticence, gentleness, loyalty, or timidity. The fact was, she was the only one. And that was luck. She couldn't possibly have arranged that in advance. Oh, what brilliant luck. And then we come, my lords. Oh, I can remember, I can remember when it happened, the day I was actually in the same committee that Lord McGregor. When the, of course, when the news came through, I remembered rejoicing with my noble friend Lord Barnett, who was leading uh, for the government. He was Chief Secretary and I was Financial Secretary of the Treasury at that occasion. And we rejoiced. We thought, well, that's marvellous. The Tories will never win a seat north of Watford from now on. It just shows how long and stupid one can be. <laughs> However, then we get to the 1979 election. Who could possibly have lost the 1979 election against a government where the, bed were, the dead were going unburied, the garbage was piling up in the streets, the country was in a state of utter shame? She couldn't possibly have lost. Anybody leading the Tory party would have won the 1979 general election. We created uh, Margaret Thatcher in that sense. Uh, as to the next two... Uh, <laughs> general elections of 1983 and 87. I have to be rather careful here. Uh, I know that uh, it is said in this world that you make your own luck. Uh, I don't know whether or not Margaret Thatcher had a big part in the choice by the Labour Party as who is to lead them into the 1983 and 1987 general elections, but she could hardly have done a better job in my view. If I say any more, I shall probably get the whip removed, so I must be, I must be very careful. Uh, so uh, she really didn't have it that difficult in uh, her two general elections. I don't uh, totally subscribe. Oh, yeah. And as for some of the other people she's up against, Arthur Scargill, I ask you. Wouldn't you love to have Arthur Scargill as your opponent in any debate going? A man who's frightened to go to his own members to get them to vote for a strike that he called? I can't, use, I can't find parliamentary language to use uh, my laws to describe uh, Arthur Scargill. Mrs. Thatcher didn't create Arthur Scargill. 
National Union Mine Workers, or certain branches of it did. Not in my part of the world, I'm glad to say. Not in the West or the East Midlands. And then the, after Arthur Scargill, uh, she's up against a bunch of fascists from a tin pot banana republic in South America. I mean, she's a gift. It's a gift. I'm told that it was a nearly, a very close run thing. We might not have won in the Falklands. I don't actually share that view, and I know that's an unorthodox view. What I do know is that certain things happened down there that shouldn't happen. There was a certain amount of military bungling took place, which was our fault. Uh, not Miss, not uh, the then lady, uh, Mrs. Thatcher's fault. But uh, as far as world opinion was concerned, to be up against a bunch of tin pot fascists was absolutely brilliant. It was lucky. She didn't decide who was going to, that the Argentines were going to invade the Falklands. She didn't decide what a bunch of so-and-sos they were going to have running their country. It was all her good luck, and good luck to her. Uh, but don't let us forget that she had an enormous amount of luck right through her career from beginning to end. Uh, and as I say that, I assure uh, Noble Lords, that is not in any way tended to diminish uh, her achievements because the important thing is, is, well, you get your luck, you use it, and you take advantage of it. And she did, ferociously, without uh, any uh, quarter being given, and I admire her greatly for that. <laughs> My Lords, I've said enough this evening. Uh, I feel very honored to have served in both places when Margaret Thatcher has been a member, but I will before. I've just remembered a little story. I will let your lordships into a secret that nobody in this chamber knows until I describe it in a moment or two. Not even, not even the noble lord, Lord Wakeham. I was once present at a conversation between Lady Thatcher, she was then Mrs. Thatcher, and Ted Heath. And I was the only person present, beat that, at the, this uh, discussion, this conversation between Lady Thatcher, Baroness Thatcher, she's then Mrs. Thatcher, and Ted Heath. And she'd only recently become leader of the Conservative Party. And it was an extraordinary event that brought this uh, to pass. I had gone to a memorial service for Hubert Humphrey. And it was held on a day cabinet was being held. So cabinet was going to come, but hadn't showed up because cabinet overran its time. And the first three rows on the left-hand side of the aisle were left empty, and I parked myself in the middle of the fourth row. And I hadn't been sitting there very long before a figure came up and sat down next to me on my left. And this was Margaret Thatcher. And she was looking sparkling and effervescent, and so needless to say, I regret to say, and no, I don't regret to say, I tried flirting with her. I thought I was doing rather well, actually. Of course, I would, wouldn't I? But uh, I complimented her on uh, how uh, the dress suited her, the colour of her eyes, all this sort of thing. We were getting on famously. And all the, the rest of the pew was completely empty. And all of a sudden, a shadow appeared at the other end of the pew, escorted by the ushers who put down next to me on this side. It was Ted Heath. <laughs> there then ensued a conversation between Margaret Thatcher myself and Ted Heath. It was a very unusual conversation in that nobody said a single thing to anybody from start to finish. <laughs> uh, considering the personalities involved, I think that's probably fairly unique. Anyway, my lords, that's enough of that story. We have lived in the shadow of greatness. We shall never see her like again. My lords, in paying my tribute to Margaret Thatcher, I can now share with the House a little piece of history I was Airy Neve's unofficial PPS in 1975 and chief bag carrier. My job was to help him organize the future leader of the Conservative Party. Uh, in the initial stages, we met in room J3 in the House of Commons. My job to book it, etc. And the first person that the, the Neve team supported was not Margaret Thatcher. It was Edward Ducan. That campaign produced, I think, about 80, 85 supporters, around those sorts of numbers. 
However, Edward came to that group and made it clear that he did not wish to stand as the future leader because he'd recently married and uh, he and his wife had discussed the situation and he was withdrawing his candidature. We had a, an immediate meeting of the group and uh, we went through the other runners that were uh, forecast to be running and the consensus was that we should ask Margaret to join us. At that point, uh, the information was that Margaret had precisely two supporters. I was asked to make contact, which I did, and uh, Margaret came to address our meeting in J3. It was clear from the way she addressed that meeting that this was a woman of considerable potential. Several members this afternoon have mentioned the word strategy. She did have a very, very clear strategy at that meeting. And she had sensed what the party wanted in a new leader. Uh, Airy turned to me and when Margaret had finished and uh, uh, said, we'll have uh, no questions now. Uh, would you be kind enough, Michael, to take Margaret to the room next door, which I did, and come back. So I came back. We had a fairly lengthy dis discussion. The unanimous view of the people present, except for three, was that uh, we should support uh, Margaret Thatcher. Uh, most of the rest is history, other than I was in charge of the 74 intake to try and persuade them to support Margaret. The second example I give of Margaret and her ability and uh, her understanding of people and countries was after we took over in 79 and I was on the back benches uh, as a PPS in Northern Ireland. Uh, I also even then had an interest in Sri Lanka. Judith Hart had uh, commissioned something called the Victoria Dam in Sri Lanka. Uh, I knew about the dam uh, costing about a hundred million and I asked to see the Prime Minister in order to uh, suggest to her that that project should go ahead. I had an audience with her, uh, with the then Overseas Development uh, Secretary of State, and Margaret said, Michael, there are two points I make to you. One, that if we as a country have an agreement with another country, as Lord Mackay said earlier today, we stick to it. So the agreement is that project will go ahead. And not only, Michael, will the project go ahead. Secondly, I wish to be there at the opening. So some years later, I was pleased to be there, with Margaret and Dennis, and uh, we had a garden party before the formal opening at the dam. And uh, the big thing in Sri Lanka in those days and every day, every time really, is the elephant, the president's elephant, named Raja. Dennis was asked whether he wished to give bananas to the elephant. Dennis, of course, accepted. Unfortunately for Dennis, he was not too good on the anatomy of an elephant. And Dennis decided that elephants actually took bananas through their trunks. Just as Margaret was about to tell him that no, don't put it in the trunk, too late. Dennis put half a dozen bananas in the trunk of the elephant, who then did a typical elephant snort, and the rest of us were covered by bananas. <laughs> and then Margaret said, I thought I told you early on that put it in his mouth, not in his trunk. Did you not hear me? So those are my two personal memories. And uh, some of you know I do take a great interest in history. Uh, if Cromwell was the catalyst of parliamentary democracy, then in my judgment, Margaret Thatcher will go down as the person who was the catalyst to change our country and to be the country it is today. Lords, um, my noble friend, Lord Tebbit, said that the two top, to top PMs, in his, using the, today's Sun terminology, two top PMs, in his view, were Margaret Thatcher and Clem Attlee. And word has it certainly that Clem Attlee was a very skilled sacker of ministers. Um, the norm when sacking a minister would be something uh, along these lines, that. Uh, Thank you very much for coming to see me, Michael. With your sophistication, you will know that I've got to make room in my government. And uh, 
you are a bit long in the tooth now and we've got younger men to look after and we'd very much enjoy it if your, your wife and you would become Governor General of the Bahamas and uh, enjoy the rest of your life. I'm told, or it is said, that uh, Clem Attlee is slightly different about this. He said, uh, look, I've got to get rid of you by the time one o'clock news comes. Um, you've got to go. Do you know why you've got to go? No, sir. Because you're no bloody good, that's why. And um, the um, fact is that he was a strong Prime Minister, like Margaret Thatcher. Now, my Lords, I intend to intervene genuinely very, for a very short time, but I feel I'm bound to do so. I was um, not as long... Prime, uh, her PPS is uh, my noble friend Lord Hamilton. I was her PPS for a short time, and I was deputy chairman of the party at the time of the Brighton uh, bomb. When Lord Devon probably doesn't remember this, rang me up from his um, police station where he'd gone with the prime minister after the bomb had gone up, and said he did say, "Get the show on." She's got two things she wants you to do: one is get the show on the road, and the other is to open shop at nine o'clock for the conference. So those are my sort of two credentials for joining in. Um, I uh, wanted to say that um, my memory, however, the one memory that I want to share with the House, goes back to the almost the last day that she was in government. Um, she summoned me, I was Minister for Housing, she summoned me to the Cabinet Room, and um, it was a one-to-one -one meeting. I was on her, my own with her. And she said uh, the words that um, will always be in my mind. Uh, we'd had our meeting and I was just packing up my papers. And she said, Michael, you know, we failed to destroy the dependency culture. And that stuck with me because a lot has been said today about her caution and I just want to say a word about that myself. But I think that what hasn't been said is that she did regret in some cases, that caution. And that's something which hasn't fully come over in my view. I mean, it wasn't just the dependency culture, though that did involve her regretting that she hadn't done anything about the welfare state to make sure that it was focused on um, those who really need the support of the welfare state. I think in the modern idiom, she would have done her nut to realize that uh, later it would be a liberal, li lab conservative, cooperative government that was the first to do something about it, but um, she did regret, not only that, but I think when it came to privatization, um, there were all sorts of things that uh, I think she would have liked. I mean, there was, we didn't privatize coal, we didn't privatize the rails, we didn't, well, she didn't rather, we didn't do, she didn't do nuclear, and she didn't do the post office. And in fact, when it came to the really difficult one, electricity, which, as it happened, I was the Minister for Electricity which took that bill through the Commons. Um, I believe that it was very much the um, powers of persuasion of my, of my Honourable Friend Lord Parkinson against the advice of Walter Marshall, the great, her great friend and mentor in many ways, that um, created the bill which we then to put through Parliament. I think it was very much touch and go as to whether we actually went ahead with that privatization because of this, uh, of this caution. I'm only stressing the caution because other people stress her excessiveness and her high rhetoric and of course the wonderful things she did achieve. Um, but uh, it wasn't just privatization in Europe, it's already been mentioned today. I mean, she did, I think, regret the single act and how far she pushed the um, Maastricht legislation before, uh, treaty before that actually came into power, uh, into, into being. So I just wanted to say that uh, this is somewhat of an antidote to some of the more, um, some of the more um, critical things that have been said about her extremism and about her um, desire to do things in a hurry. I think far from it. I think she felt that she had not done things in a hurry enough sometimes and I just wanted to put that to, to the, the House because I think that so much has been misinterpreted about her, um, her impetuosity 
and that's, that's come across in several speeches today. I think she was a very cautious person, and I think she was a very wise person, and that's why she was so effective, and it was such a great honour to serve with her in that context. Yes. Lord, I would express uh, sympathy to Mark and Carol uh, Thatcher, and I would like to endorse the view expressed by several noble lords that she was prepared to go the extra mile on small, non-political, uh, non-party matters uh, last thing at night when she returned to her office in uh, Downing Street. I remember being told this by the late Ian Gow who took me into her office and it showed me uh, the kind of letters which were sent to her including bottles of whiskey for charity fates and the like and just like an old trooper she would settle down and sign the lot. Uh, if I may say so, being a minister in her government was challenging, interesting and never dull. In Scotland, home ownership went up from about 30% to about 60% under her premiership, which was a massive change. Uh, Baroness Thatcher believed very strongly in expanding home ownership, and one episode is extremely vivid in my memory. The Prime Minister was in Up Hall, West Lothian, for the first rent to mortgage sale in Scotland to former public sector tenants uh, in that small house. As we stood in their sitting room, a girl who was editor of the local school magazine asked the Prime Minister, as she, uh, Mrs. Thatcher, as she then was, what was her favourite sport. The Prime Minister immediately gave a surprising revelation that her favourite sport was skiing. She then went on to say that neither she nor any of her ministers would actually be doing any skiing at all, as none of them could afford the time off if they broke a leg. Now, as it happened, I looked across at the noble lord, Lord Forsyth of Drumlee, who was Secretary of State for Scotland, standing just beside her, and I knew for a fact that both he and myself had just completed our arrangements to go skiing within days, if not hours. So we gave each other a smile but said not a word. After the ceremonial transfer of ownership, I was invited to go in the Prime Minister's car with her, and as we left, a protester hurled an egg straight at us. The driver accelerated and the egg landed harmlessly in the road. The Prime Minister looked as though absolutely nothing had happened, and it was then that I realised that she was not called the Iron Lady for nothing. She may not have made a farewell address to this House, but she certainly summed up what she believed in in two sentences in her book on statecraft, showing all her continuing zeal and cutting edge. She wrote, the demand that power be limited and accountable, the determination that force shall not override justice, the conviction that individual human beings have an absolute moral worth, which government must respect. Such things are uniquely embedded in political culture, in the political culture of the English-speaking people. They are our enduring legacy to the world. She was very much at home in the House of Commons. She was a standard bearer for parliamentary democracy, and that is something which her own family can be very proud of, and so can we as parliamentarians. Yeah, hold on. My, my Lords, I've listened to all the wonderful tributes that have been paid this afternoon and this evening, and I've asked myself whether there is anything which I can add to them, and I think there are just one or two aspects which I would like to add. I wasn't going to speak about the Brighton bomb, because her resolution, her courage uh, on that occasion has been very widely dealt with. But since Lord Debon referred to it, and the tragicomic aspect of it, I think I just ought to supplement the picture he gave of his crawling to the door and opening the door and uh, meeting Margaret Thatcher's face the other side by the fact that, as he, glad to see him in his place, as he may remember, she was gorgeously attired in the blue evening dress that she'd been wearing for the blue ball, which did add to the absurdity of, the, uh, of that uh, tragic uh, situation. 
Um, the, I was very pleased that um, reference was made to the kindness which the noble Lord, Lord Forsyth, has shown to her, but there is, I think, another person who should be added, and that is a colleague of uh, mine on the cross benches, a colleague in number 10, and that is Lord Powell of Bayswater. Yeah. He and his wife have yeah. been absolutely splendid to Lady Thatcher in her latter days. Indeed, I think on Sunday evening, he was the last person outside her family to uh, visit her. Um, about a month or so ago, he said he'd been uh, with her uh, on a Sunday afternoon, and I said to him, what did you talk to her about? Because, of course, in her latter uh, months, she found conversation difficult. He said, we didn't talk. We turned on the television, and we watched songs of praise, and we sung the hymns together. I think it's a lovely picture of uh, those two doing that. Uh, the noble Lord, Lord Armstrong, has spoken uh, splendidly about the support which uh, Margaret Thatcher gave him as Cabinet Secretary, and indeed the support uh, which she gave to the civil service and the esteem in which she held it. And I don't want to add to that, except just to endorse everything that he said, uh, as uh, in my experience, uh, in the post which he occupied uh, before me. But um, I, I, what I would like to do is to take up uh, what Lord Mackay said about her role as a lawyer, and I'm very glad he did refer to that. And uh, I had a word with him outside the chamber, and another aspect of that, which I think needs to be emphasised, was the way in which she upheld the rule of law which is a very important principle in her life. I remember that um, I was travelling in a car with her uh, when we saw on a newspaper hoarding that the High Court had found against the government in the judicial review about the government's banning of unions at uh, GCHQ. The Prime Minister was going to the House of Commons that afternoon and it was clear that, quite understandably, the Labour Party would make a lot of this and would be jubilant about it because they had supported the trade unions in opposing the government's action. And I remember that she said, well, we must appeal, but if the court rules against us, we must, of course, accept their judgment. We cannot ask the miners to accept the rule of law if we, the government, are not prepared to accept it ourselves. And that's just one illustration of the principle uh, that she held. When judicial review was gaining force, I, and when I was head of the civil service, I suggested to her that we might arrange a seminar between senior civil servants and some of the judges so that the judges knew more about the way in which decisions were taken in government. Absolutely not, she said. I'm not going to have any appearance of the executive appearing to interfere with the independence of the judges. We must keep them strictly separate. And that is an aspect of her principles and of her administration, which I don't think has been much mentioned. The other thing which hasn't been mentioned, Lord Armstrong, spoke of his experience of working with her as Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Lord Turnbull was here earlier, but w nobody has spoken about uh, the experience of working with her as a private secretary. And uh, like Lord Turnbull, I was her principal private secretary, in my case, between 1982 and 1985. And inside Number 10, having the privilege of seeing her in that intimate setting, we did, of course, see a very different person from the person that the public saw outside. The public saw the bravura performances, the confidence she's been charged with being overconfident, even arrogant. That you saw a very different picture before the great public appearances inside number 10. Somebody whose, whose motivation, whose force was not built on overconfidence, but was in fact built on lack of self-confidence. 
And I say that because I heard her say it herself publicly after she left office. She said it was a thing that the media never really realised about her. And I believe that was a driving force, and it was a driving force behind her perfectionism in her appearance, in her dress, in her speeches, and in her grip on her briefing. Mm. All those things had to be perfect before she would appear in public. And um, there was a reference earlier to uh, her on the, the conference speech after the Brighton bomb, sitting in the green room and saying, I'm not sure I can go through with this. And Gordon Rees said, of course you can go with, through with it. I am absolutely certain she was always going to go through with it. But I, many, many times I saw her beforehand say, I'm not sure I can do this. And then she would go out and give a bravura performance. When I was Principal or Private Secretary, in briefing her for Prime Minister's questions, I didn't brief her on the facts. Other people did that. But I regarded my job as calming her down, usually, by reassuring her that her case was good in answer to her question, just occasionally if she was sleepy after lunch, of working her up a bit and saying, Prime Minister, you've got to worry about this question. This is quite difficult. But anyway, getting the horse to the starting gate with exactly the right amount of perspiration on the flanks, <laughs> and then she would perform superbly in the House of Commons. I was very glad that Lord Jopling uh, said earlier that um, criticisms that she never listened were quite misplaced. She did listen, but she talked at the same time. <laughs> she could listen while she talked. And it is true that she regarded attack as the best form of defense. Uh, uh, but she was also always willing to learn. And I just offer finally an anecdote to the House which I think illustrates these three characteristics. It actually relates to a time after she'd ceased to be Prime Minister and after I'd ceased to be Cabinet Secretary. She came very kindly to my college at Oxford to talk. And in the course of her remarks to the students, she said that one of the things she, asked, she worried about in uh, modern life and the life facing their generation was the number of children born illegitimate. And when it came round to questions, one of the students said to her, Lady Thatcher, don't you think it's a little unfair to use the word illegitimate of a child throughout its life when it has had no influence over the circumstances of its own birth? And her eyes flashed. And she said, well, what would you call them? I can think of another word, but I think it would be even more unkind. And I thought, goodness, what's going to happen? Anyway, the moment passed. And she came to dinner, she came to chapel, and uh, in the latter part of the evening, we were having a drink in the master's lodgings before she and Dennis went back to London. We were talking about other things completely. And she suddenly said, you know, Robin, that young man who asked me this afternoon about the word illegitimate, he had a point, didn't he? And that was quite characteristic. I will wager she never used the word illegitimate again. She was prepared always to learn, even from a student. And she hit back immediately, but then she thought about it and she took the point. Those are just three reminiscences I've got out of a treasure house of memories. I never had any doubt while I was working with her as private secretary and as cabinet secretary that I was a witness to greatness and to, as well as to great events. And those are memories that I will treasure all my life. My, <coughs> my Lords, after that very powerful and moving speech by the noble Lord, Lord Butler, um, I, I just want to talk very briefly about the relationship which the late uh, Baroness Thatcher had with the 
parliament with the Conservative Party uh, in the country. Uh, two reflections and two comments. First of all, um, uh, as the present chairman of the Carlton Club, preceded by my noble friend Lord Wakeham uh, a few years ago, um, uh, she uh, uh, was elected uh, um, an honorary member at a time in, 1970, in, in 1975 when women were not members of the club. Incidentally, the Carlton Club in 1922 broke the coalition. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, in any way indicating that history is going to repeat itself. But the Carlton Club uh, has 65 members of your Lordship's house and the other place and uh, has long revered and treasured um, Baroness Thatcher's uh, in involvement with the club. She was elected uh, in 1975 as an honorary member when women were not members of the club. And I'm quite certain through her quiet determination and conversations with many that that ultimately led to the club opening its doors to women members. Uh, she didn't argue the case, she was just quietly and consistently encouraging. And I think uh, she, uh, all members of the club, I think, are in her, her debt. Uh, in 1990, some colleagues will remember that uh, our club was bombed by the IRA and we lost uh, one, mem uh, one member of parliament and several uh, other members. And she came almost immediately to the club and spoke uh, to those who were injured uh, and uh, also to the family. Uh, families of those who were killed, and that was very much appreciated. The uh, second aspect is the wider party in the country, and I, I speak with m modest experience as uh, someone who had responsibility for the selection of candidates to my party. She did make uh, a tremendous effort uh, to tour the country and encourage candidates, and she always took the trouble to write to the candidate afterwards. And I think many of those who were the subsequently elected to the other place still keep those letters, which were not just two or three lines. They were complimentary and encouraging um, words, uh, which I think made a tremendous difference. Uh, and if I could just finish uh, with a very brief anecdote. Uh, in 1986, it seems a long time ago, so I was summoned to uh, Downing Street to become a, a junior minister and I said to the Prime Minister, thank you very much, this is a great day, and my wife has just had a baby daughter. And she said, what's the hospital, what's the telephone number? Fortunately I could remember it. <laughs> she dialed the hospital and, she, and uh, the receptionist answered it and the Prime Minister said, this is the Prime Minister speaking. And I could hear the lady at the other end saying, pull the other leg. <laughs> and so the Prime Minister said, I don't think I will, my dear, just put me through. And it w really was much appreciated by my wife, uh, and she talks about it constantly. Uh, condolences to the family. A great lady, greatly missed. My Lord, sir. Um I thought I should rise a moment just very briefly to explain that uh, we've been able to gain just two more speakers. So uh, we have uh, concluded there the 35th backbench speaker and uh, we will conclude, I believe, after 44. Uh, next will be my noble friend Lord Palumbo. Uh, then we then turn to the crossbenches for the noble Lord Lord Burns and back to the, my, um, uh, the conservative benches for my noble friends Lord Molesford, uh, Alcaith Ness, uh, Baroness Oka-Hoyne, then back to the crossbenches for the noble Lord, Lord Wilson of Dinton, and then uh, finally back to the conservative benches to my noble friends uh, Lord Flight, Viscount Bridgman and Baroness Buscombe. Three very short, random stories. On one occasion my wife asked Margaret what she thought of Tony Blair. My dear, she said, I don't think of him. That was all. <laughs> we, we've heard from uh, the noble Lord, Lord King, about Margaret's support for Desert Storm, the first war in Iraq. 
And we've heard that it was, to some extent, due to her, that he had the backbone to go to war. When I asked her, some years later, what she would have done if Iraq, the Second World War, had come on her watch. She said, it is not sufficiently or fully realized that I was a scientist before I became a politician. As a scientist, what we need are facts, evidence, and proof. <coughs> and if we have the facts, and we have the evidence, and we have the proof, we can check and recheck and check as many times as is necessary before coming to a considered view. She said, the answer to your question is that we had very few facts. We had no evidence, and we certainly had no proof. And so I would not have committed uh, one single member of the armed services to a war from which they may not have, have returned. What I would have done was to give George Bush the sort of assistance that Ronnie Reagan gave me in the Falklands. That is to say, logistical support, intelligence support, but nothing more. And I would have told Bush so to his face. Very definite about that. When she offered me some years before the chairmanship of the Arts Council, she said to me, uh, Mr. Plumber, I want you to understand one thing very clearly, and you must not forget it. The government has no money. You are being asked to supervise the distribution of a great deal of money. And you must spend it wisely and carefully because it's taxpayers' money, it's not government money. That is advice that I shall ne obviously never forget, any more than I shall forget a wonderfully kind and utterly magnificent lady. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like many other noble lords, I uh, owe Baroness Thatcher a huge debt of, of gratitude. Uh, towards the end of 1979, on the advice of, uh, of the noble lord, Lord Howe, I was appointed as chief economic advisor to the, the Treasury, uh, in a position that I held uh, throughout uh, the, uh, the rest of uh, Mrs. Thatcher's time as, uh, as Prime Minister. And so during that 10-year period, I had the, the privilege of attending many meetings uh, with her. Uh, I had enormous opportunities to watch the particular style of, uh, of debate and the method that she used as, uh, as challenge, something that I had never seen uh, before. And apart from late night uh, speech writing sessions, which uh, occasionally I did get uh, involved in, most of course of my experiences were accompanying the, the chancellors of the day, either uh, initially Lord Howe and, and then of course Lord Lawson. Uh, and by their very nature, of course, we were dealing with the major issues of, uh, of economic policy, and even more so by their nature, they were usually very controversial. We were, had these sessions normally because there were some difficult issues to uh, sort out. They were very tense, very often they were great, you know, there, there, were, there were tricky issues to, to be resolved, and at, at times one didn't expect sometimes to reach resolution. Uh, many times as I, as I left, she, well, not many, certainly more than once as I left, she, she said to me, I just want you to look when you go out of that door and see what it says on the door, uh, just to remind me that it said First Lord of the Treasury. And that at the final analysis, it was going to be uh, her, her word she, she was trying to indicate. And of course, those people who, who haven't worked with, uh, uh, with Mrs. Thatcher assume that by her very nature that she begins and ends with an entrenched position and she refuses to, to listen. And the main point I wanted to make uh, today was that like many noble lords who have spoken, this is not at all how the process uh, took place. I mean, part of her enormous talent was this ability to question and to challenge and to question and to press you on issues 
as a way of trying to, to find uh, whether or not the views that she held herself uh, in a sense could stand that stress testing or, or not. She both, I always felt, was trying to test her own ideas and she was trying to test your ideas to see how they stood up to this process of, uh, of questioning. I think the, like all, like all very great leaders, she had a very strong set of principles and values and a clear sense of, of what she wanted to achieve. But what I noticed, you know, looking back and thinking back through some of the episodes, and I have spoken also sometimes at length to people who have been writing biographies of, uh, of Mrs. Thatcher, uh, the issues that we, we dealt with were looked at in enormous depth. The idea that these were ideas that were, were pulled off at a, in a casual way and were immediately pursued could not be further from the truth. I mean, these were issues that we went through time and time again, very often at meeting after meeting, until all of the aspects of the, of the problem had been uh, identified and she was satisfied that we had covered the, the issues. And I often think that it was as a result really of the, the, the extent of that process and the argument, that she, the, the debate, that she actually gained the strength in the end to, to make the decisions and to stick to them, of course, in the way that is, is, is very well uh, known. Now, as many people have pointed out, of course, she was not always right. And she often changed her position on uh, issues. But I think that uh, whatever view you take uh, of individual parts of it, I join with many others in, in thinking that the, uh, the, the contribution that she, that she made in terms of the transformation of the, of the British economy was really quite uh, enormous. And I have little doubt that it came about by this combination of a very clear strategic mind, but also this ability to concentrate and to look at issues in depth, to stress test them and to go through them at great length before finally coming to a conclusion. The, the other point I'd like to make is that in recent days I have heard it suggested that somehow the recent financial crisis has its origins in, in her approach to uh, economic policy. And uh, for me, I have to say, nothing could be further from the, the truth. I mean, those who have worked with Mrs. Thatcher know that she disliked financial excess, whether it was in the private or the public mm -hmm. uh, sector. And in the early 1980s, when we were struggling with very rapid growth of, uh, of money supply, she frequently asked why there co could not be some limits to the leverage ratios of banks, even in a deregulated system, and was only very reluctantly put off this approach, which of course has now become much more fashionable today after the events of uh, of, of recent uh, years. And also, you know, as a surprise journalist said to me yesterday that after the events of recent years, he had been looking at some of the things that Mrs. Thatcher had said about the, the single currency and had been really quite astonished to discover that in fact most of the things that had occurred in the last few years had, uh, had been part of the debate and part of the argument that had taken place as to why uh, the, she, she came to the view that the UK should not be part of, of a single currency. So along with many others, I, I, I regard myself as enormously fortunate to have played you know, a very small part in those uh, momentous uh, years. As, as, as Lord Butler uh, has said, uh, there was something of, of real greatness about, uh, about Mrs Thatcher and I feel very privileged to have, have watched that and, and I feel confident that, or I would like to hope, that I learned a great deal actually from those sessions and that extraordinary process of, of discussion, of challenge, debate, and really testing the ideas of the people that you work with. My Lord, I suppose that one of the things one thinks most of about Margaret Thatcher is she was the most courageous challenger. And one of the reasons that I think she will have an increasing part in the history books is that she actually presided over and contributed to the ending of one of the great political struggles in this country, which was the struggle between capitalism and socialism as economic systems. Margaret Thatcher could always see the real point. I was for three and a half years in uh, Whitehall as an advisor and worked a certain amount with the um, think tank. And I remember very well in the presentations which were made by the think tank at Chequers. On one occasion, um, one of the things was to show where the government was going, even if it didn't want to go there. 
and I remember the noble Lord, Lord Butler, was performing and he was demonstrating um, the way in which inflation would reach unthinkable double digits. And there was a silence, broken by Margaret Thatcher thumping on her desk, on her blotter at the cabinet table in Chequers, saying, if that chart is true, we've lost the next election. And then Tony Barber, who was at the time the uh, Chancellor, waded in to say it was not true. Of course, it was very true. Um, and I would just point out to uh, the, the noble Baroness, um, Baroness Dean, when she mentioned what a pity that uh, Margaret Thatcher hadn't tried more to talk to the union leaders. Nobody could have tried harder to talk to the union leaders than Ted Heath. Indeed, we actually had a thing called tripartite government, which was government, industry, and unions. And a fat lot of good that did. But I remember very well indeed, after the um, 74 election, um, for those summer months, I used as a functionnaire to attend meetings of the uh, Shadow Cabinet. And they were very difficult meetings because Mr. Heath didn't really accept that he'd made mistakes and that things had to change. And he and um, Sir Keith Joseph um, used to spar. And I remember on one occasion, um, uh, Ted Heath saying to Keith Joseph, well, I suppose you'd let British Leyland go to the wall. And Keith Joseph said, well, of course I would if they couldn't put their house in order. And Ted replied, well, in that case, you'd have blood on the streets. And it all was very awkward and difficult. And as the shadow cabinet left the room, and I was following behind, suddenly Margaret Thatcher um, came up to me and she said, Mark, you know, Keith has nearly had enough. And the day he goes, I go. And basically, it was from that moment that she realized the need to challenge, make a challenge that had never previously been made. I was very struck with the noble Lord, Lord Soley's speech about the unions, because of course there were huge variations. Some of the union leaders were people of great patriotism and did a wonderful job. But there were others, and they were often in powerful positions, who used their position not in the interests of their members, but used them to lead them over the economic cliff, often into economic suicide, to unemployment. Um, um, British Leyland was in the days of Red Robo leading it. It was a hopeless system. Now, as a result of restructuring, we once again have a great automobile industry in this country. We could never have done it if that challenge hadn't been made. And I would describe um, one of Margaret Thatcher's great contributions as being a contribution to what I'd call liberation politics, because she liberated a lot of people who'd had really no prospects because they were in that proletariat herd. She hugely enlarged the middle class, the bourgeoisie of this country. We are now, as a result of the structural changes which she introduced, I believe we are a much more equal society than we were then, because far more people, I'd say tens or hundreds of thousands of people, now have an opportunity of running their own lives in a way which they did not have before she was around and was Prime Minister. Yeah, yeah. My Lords, this has been a fascinating uh, afternoon and early evening uh, with the tributes that have been paid to an extraordinary lady, and I'm sure that history will be more accurate as a result of it, uh, as she has been shown not only to be an iron lady, but a caring and sensitive uh, woman as well. My Lords, she changed so many uh, of our lives. I can remember in 1979 sitting in the Lords Gallery in another place at the vote of no confidence, watching some of the left-wing Labour MPs singing the red flag, thinking, who is going to be able to change this? I mean, old Mrs. Thatcher stopped the rot of what politicians had been doing for so long, and which they started to go back to after uh, she uh, was unceremoniously removed from power. They used to agree to be firm, to take firm action, but by the time they had Got, even got back to their desks, that resolve had started to wane and the condition of the country, as so many people have said, deteriorated. Well, she gave not just herself but all of us 
a belief and a confidence that things could change and it required a woman to uh, give us men and other women that backbone and that inspiration that a country can be changed if you have the, the commitment. My Lord, she changed my life personally too uh, through the kind offices of the then Chief Whip, our great Chief Whip at that time, Lord Denham. I was asked to become a member of her government in 1984. And it, my noble friend uh, Lord Hiller Walford uh, used the word her small thoughtful actions. Uh, I had never met uh, my Prime Minister at that stage and I was invited to a reception at Downing Street and I was taken uh, by my kinsman from marriage, the, the late Earl of Swinton and I said, David, will you introduce me? And he did and there was the receiving line, many more important people behind me than me and Mrs Thatcher stopped, took me out of the receiving line and spent five minutes showing me the pictures and the important things in Downing Street. My Lords, I reckon that for any chief executive to take the newest employee of the company out time out to do something like that is extraordinary. And we've heard other tributes like that. How did that lady manage to find the time every day to spend time making other people feel that they were important? The noble Lord, Lord Armstrong, I was to mention, she showed glutton for hard work and detail. After six months in the Home Office, my Lords, of studying prisons day in, day out, I was summoned to a meeting with her and found that she actually knew far more about prisons than I ever did at that time. And I came out of the meeting thoroughly chastened and realized that unless I learnt yet more and more and more, I will be one of the next to be sacked from her government, and quite rightly, she was the chief executive. How did she know more about one little section of the Home Office that I was in charge of when she had the whole country to run? I thought that was a, an amazing piece of briefing and retentive memory and I guess too the experience of having a uh, Prime Minister for a number of years by that stage. And th th there is one aspect my that I, nobody has mentioned yet. Uh, we have talked about how she changed her mind, but nobody has said how loyal she was when she changed her mind. I remember as a, a junior minister, most of the speeches that we've heard today have been from former secretaries of state in other place. Uh, I am one of the diminishing band of people who haven't been appointed by a Prime Minister that's actually been elected into this House and, and been part of the government. And I was discussing her when I was in the environment uh, and she agreed to change the policy. It was a, a long and tough discussion. It involved uh, various other departments. But when she grasped that the, the policy needed changing, she was the one that went up in front and you were merely carrying the standard behind her. And I thought, again, to have a chief executive like that, I had never experienced that in the private sector. In all the jobs I'd done in the private sector, I had never experienced that sort of leadership. And it was a tremendous support for junior ministers. So my words, it wasn't just the tea ladies uh, and the, uh, the staff. It wasn't just the secretaries of state. It was all levels of government. Uh, and when the government is 100 people and the number of times that the government changed, it is, I think, a remarkable lady that we are paying tribute uh, to, to today. My Lord, it is always an honour to be asked to serve your country as a member of a government. To me, my Lords, it has been a particular privilege to be a loyal lieutenant to one amazing lady who changed the way our country operates. My Lords, this has been a remarkable day a day that none of us who have sat through it will ever forget. Of course, it is also a very sad day. It's a day of finality, a day when we know that we will never have Margaret Thatcher in our midst again. Having said that, we must send our condolences, of course, to the family. And as I do that, I am convinced that once the raw effects of bereavement, and they can be pretty raw, lessen, <laughs> they will realize just how blessed they have been having a mother and a grandmother of such a woman. I think in a few years' time, those grandchildren will read something and say, gosh, that was my grandmother. She was one of the most historic women of the second part of the sec of 20th century. 
I'm speaking because um, of 39 speakers, 49 speakers, I'm told, there are going to be only six women. And I think this is, this is, this is okay. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't, we don't have to feel we've got to speak. But I want to speak especially for those who are not belonging to the political Westminster village. Um, I came to this position um, so honoured, and it was never on my radar screen. In fact, I thought when I was asked to come to the House of Lords, I was asked to have dinner in the House of Lords. Mm -hmm. I mean, I should not be here, but I hope that I have contributed something. But I think that when Margaret Thatcher was elected Prime Minister, there was a frisson amongst my group, my peer group, and every woman who had been struggling with qualifications, but just trying to, and I won't use the glass ceiling analogy, just get up that ladder a bit, work that bit harder, do a bit more development study, do a bit more work, and think, will we ever get there? And suddenly, we saw this lady, who was so perfect in every way. I mean, nobody, no human being is perfect, but she seemed to be perfect in every way. And she was a role model for so many of us. And I think actually quite an interesting thing did happen. I'm now going back to the 70s. Uh, when the suddenly began to be, and I'm sure that Baroness Dean has also expect, uh, experienced this, there was a sudden burgeoning of women's networks. Now, networks, not necessarily, oh, you know, you know somebody in that company, do you think I can get a job? None of that but just to see how they could, in turn, make their rightful, take their rightful place in this country. I was president of the Women in Banking and Finance Network for about four years. I took over, actually, from another member of this house that was uh, uh, my noble friend, Baroness Platt. And she is the wonderful woman who, right from the 40s, always had a screwdriver in her bag. She was an aeronautical engineer. I mean, she was a role model for me, not that I couldn't do engineering or physics or chemistry or anything like that. But this was the sort of woman who set up this Women in Banking and Finance network. And they are remarkable people. Now, a lot of them have got senior positions in accountancy firms and consulting firms, and they've done so well. How do they do it? Because they meet frequently, they network, they go on development courses, they play golf together. And it's not the equivalent to a man's club. It's nothing like that. It's not a sorority as they have in the States. It's actually groups, and they have them in all sorts of industry. I know the retail sector has them professional groups of lawyers, and just because they have women in the title, men sort of say, oh, you know, you're off doing this. But men have been doing it for years, so why shouldn't they? We have a lot of time, a lot to catch up. But one of the things about today, I've been sitting here listening avidly, and it really is a marvellous four or five hours, I don't know how many would be at it, actually. Um, it, time passes quickly when, when, when you're interested. Of, of a history lesson. And I know that history is becoming more and more fashionable now. In fact, uh, my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Education, is trying to highlight history as part of the curriculum, which is very important, I think. So I think, this is a zany idea, but I just thought to myself, why can't we get, in about four or five weeks' time, or well, maybe the next term when it begins in September, a copy of today's Hansard in every school? So they can actually have it, and they learn from it. I know I've taken that, that idea from the one of Michael Gove, who has put the King James Bible in every school. And as I'm a Bible follower, I don't want to think that there's an equivalence between the Bible and today's Hansard, and that you're all evangelists or prophets. But I do think that it would be one of these ideas. Let not, we have history here today which is alive. It, was, it is compelling. And I think people out there of any age would be compelled to listen to it. Um, I'm so, um, wait, I see. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, I'm speaking this way from my personal experience, I said, outside the Westminster village. And I believe that following the election of Margaret Thatcher, women have suddenly got more spring in their step. We have a lot more to do. We've had several debates in this House about the uh, women on boards and women in industry and women in the, in the political sector. But all I'm saying is that we'll miss her. 
but we should benefit from her and we're all so grateful to have known her. My Lords, uh, I rise... My Lords, I did explain a little while earlier that there were two editions, so um, I, I hesitate to call it all rules of, of Dinton in an edition, but we now turn to the crossbenches before we go to my noble friends. It's the crossbenches next. Thank you. Um, I would like to add my own <coughs> tribute to the wealth of tributes which we've heard today. Um, not, of course, at a political level, but as an official who worked for, served the Prime Minister, Mrs. Um, for three years, 1987 to 1990, as head of her domestic and economic secretariat under uh, the noble Lord, Lord Armstrong, and then the noble Lord, Lord Butler. It was a period of extraordinary, rapid change in so many areas. Um, local government, the community charge, I still can't call it the poll tax, we were trained not to. Um, the uh, National Health Service, privatisation, uh, education, introduction of the curriculum, um, the, the list uh, felt endless, the inner cities and so on. Uh, and it, she depended, Mrs Thatcher, very heavily on briefing. Uh, uh, she would use it once she came to the conclusion she could rely upon you. Uh, and she used it uh, very, uh, very intensively. So you had to get it right. Uh, there were occasions when uh, she would disagree with uh, one of her colleagues in a meeting uh, and uh, she would challenge them as to whether they were right or not on the strength of a brief. And I can tell you, you learn things about the human body that, where your pores open in moments of stress, uh, which uh, I, I won't forget. But the other side of the coin was that she worked enormously hard. You, this, I'm sure, uh, is, is well known. But I remember it, we delivered lots of briefs to her in the evenings. And by the morning, she would have mastered them and be ready to use them uh, with, with, with enormous skills and, and challenge. And I remember saying to her on one occasion, you must have worked very late to get all this uh, 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 into your mind. Uh, and she said, well, I find midnight is the worst. By 12.30, I get a second wind. Uh, and I think that, for me, uh, it captures it. And she also was very generous in the way she treated people who worked for her. Uh, she attributed uh, to you uh, qualities which you certainly didn't have. I remember sitting down one meeting next to her, and she was deep in thought. And she turned to me and she said, now, can you explain to me what is a put option, which is quite a difficult question, cold when a lot of other ministers are coming in. And on another occasion, when we were, the ministers were discussing um, the national curriculum, uh, she was passionate about the importance of uh, people's school children learning poetry by heart. And she launched unexpectedly into some Robert Browning, which she quoted at some length, and then she couldn't remember what came next, and she turned to me as the secretary and said, now what happens? And of course I had the faintest notion what happens next. It was very generous of her to think that one might know, but of course I didn't. Uh, and she also was very kind in a slightly, sometimes in a rather clumsy way. I was summoned on a Saturday uh, to Chequers to explain to her a very complicated submission which I'd put to her on the Friday night about how we might make the poll tax work or avoid some of the more difficult consequences which it seemed likely to have. And it was really, really technically difficult. Um, and I was shown in to, in to, in to, in to see her and she gave me a cup of tea uh, which I had in one hand and in the other she had an enormous cream bun <laughs> covered in icing sugar so when you spoke clouds of and she and we then had this very difficult serious discussion while I held these two <laughs> objects in my hand uh, and it was a good meeting but it was it was sort of slightly unusual we've heard uh, uh, from the noble Lord Lord Spicer about her caution but, and there were all sorts of sides to that quality one that I used to be uh, astonished by the way the certainty uh, with which she felt she knew and understood what the British people were feeling and thinking and what 
uh, and where they stood, whatever everyone else uh, in her, among her colleagues was saying or thinking. I have one example that comes to mind, which was um, a decision had been taken that the National Dock Labour Scheme should be abolished. It was being planned in great secrecy, and we reached the point where the uh, ministers were in a position to give the go-ahead. There was a fear of a, a strike and so on. And um, we met, uh, and Mrs. the Prime Minister, Mrs. Thatcher, said, now I can see all the plans are ready, um, but I think I should say that we're not going to go ahead with this decision today. We're not going to make the announcement. It's January. It's cold. It's foggy. The public are depressed. They've had enough bad news. This is not the right time. We will wait until the spring when the sun is out and the daffodils are out and it will be all right. And I found myself thinking, well, how do we record this? But we recorded it. <laughs> um, and lo and behold, the government waited until the spring and the decision went exactly as she said it was fine. But there was a sense in which she was certain about the timing. It was all going on in her head that was very impressive. And the other side of, 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 of Mrs. Thatcher, which I, do, I hope doesn't get overlooked, was her, her interest in science. She had done a PhD as, and um, I remember number 10 organizing groups of PhD or postdoctoral researchers to come and meet her and she would grill them for an afternoon and they would emerge looking exhausted and she would look hugely refreshed by the experience of having cross-examined them on their science. And in, I think it was in the autumn of 1988, she had read over the summer about climate change and she had decided this was a really big problem which people had underestimated. And I'm not sure the world remembers, but she made a speech to the Royal Society, way ahead of, of uh, international opinion or opinion in this country. And she very clearly set out what the problem was in scientific terms, and she drew attention to the threats it had for future generations and the, the moral imperative she thought that governments had to act on it. Uh, and it was a very important landmark uh, in people uh, realizing that it was a problem. It, it, it's an illustration of the limitations of the power of even the great Prime Minister like Mrs. Thatcher that very little happened immediately because of it. But, but it is interesting that her scientific background led her into that, into that, um, into that insight. Um, I hope the noble Lord, Lord Butler, will not mind that I re finally uh, remember uh, that when she had surrend surrendered her office to the, Her Majesty, the Queen, uh, he gave a small impromptu party to enable uh, some of us who'd worked for her to say farewell. And I remember two things about that occasion. Um, one was that she was going round, I'm not even sure she was entirely knew what she was saying to everyone, but she was saying very intense things. And I remember her uh, coming up and saying to me, what I always feel about problems in government is that the important thing is to work out what is the right thing to do. You may not be able to achieve it, or you may not be able to achieve it immediately, but that has to be your starting point, that has to be your goal. And that, for me, is what marks her out as an outstanding and extraordinary leader, perhaps above all. And the other thing I remember is Lord Butler himself saying in his speech to her, Prime Minister, when we are old and retired, the interesting thing, the only really interesting thing about us will be that we worked for you. And I think, that was a, I think that was a lovely compliment, and I think what we're all doing today is proving that that remark, that compliment, was right. And I certainly feel hugely privileged uh, for having worked for her. It's three years I would not have missed for all the world. Thank you. My Lords, uh, I, I rise to pay tribute to Margaret Thatcher, whom I believe was easily the greatest Briton of my adult lifetime. And there are six uh, particular points uh, I'd like to refer to, uh, some of which have been touched upon by others. But something that has struck me uh, strongly has been the enormous loyalty 
uh, devotion and affection both felt towards Lady Thatcher by all those that have worked for her, including the police that were responsible for her safety, uh, and which she very much reciprocated. She was such, in many ways, a warm person, quite the opposite to her perhaps public image. Um, I think the second point related to that is that, and as many have pointed out earlier, she was a person of great kindness, compassion, and actually of modesty. Uh, I believe ahead of every general election she would pack her bags at number 10 because she was by no means take, uh, uh, taking it for granted that she was going to win an election even if she was ahead in the polls. For millions uh, of British, uh, of all walks of life, men and women, uh, she has been their heroine. Uh, and I've found that for so many people uh, who have met her, they've said to me, that was the highlight of my life. They realised greatness when they were uh, in uh, its presence. And fourthly, uh, and I think, again, this is something, a point that has been made by others, but that comes out so, so strongly. She was someone of great integrity, of honesty, of principle. She had uh, a strong sense of duty, uh, and both in national politics uh, and in her own uh, private life. She was also, I think, the, the key champion uh, of personal aspiration, uh, of equality of opportunity. Uh, and not only was this about enabling people to own their own houses, it was enabling them to start their own businesses, to buy shares. Uh, and she was the person who very much got rid of uh, damaging old-fashioned uh, class loyalties uh, and turned the majority of this country into the broad uh, uh, non-offensive label, I think, of, of middle class. Uh, it, was, it was what she achieved that has led to that. Now, she was uh, also the architect not just of uh, our turning round the British economy uh, after all the problems of the 1970s, but uh, of a business revolution. Uh, and I'd just like to uh, uh, give brief quotes from leading businessmen, uh, by no means members of the, or members of the Conservative Party. I think uh, Lord Brown, uh, ex of BP, uh, said she breathed life into free enterprise. Lord Sugar said she created the opportunity for anyone to succeed in the UK. Uh, Sir Richard Bransom has said she understood what was needed to make business thrive and to turn the country into a country of entrepreneurs. Um, I think many people forget that before her time, even the words venture capital and entrepreneur hardly existed in the English language, and certainly there was very little of it uh, in practice. Uh, and m so much of what has actually been a success story in this country since then has been the growth of small businesses, of new businesses, employing over 13 million people. Uh, and I, I just cite, it's perhaps a little specialist, but the, um, the Cambridge cluster that has come up, 629 businesses, uh, a turnover of over 11 billion, employing 53,000 people, and in the key new areas of IT and technology, life science and physical sciences. Lady Thatcher would have been proud of that. She would have seen that it promised a future, a, a, a promising economic future for this country. But it was something, certainly in the first 20 years of my own life, which uh, we, we, we never even thought uh, about the ability to be entrepreneurs uh, and, and to get new businesses up and running. I was privileged to have got to know uh, Lady Thatcher a little in, after she became uh, Prime Minister, and the more I knew her, the more I admired her. Uh, and I would echo the comments of others, uh, even in the latter parts of her life, as regards her beauty and those amazing eyes. Uh, and I, I often think warmly of when I'd put her into her car after uh, a certain events that, that I'd attended, uh, that if she'd had uh, a, a good conversation, particularly often with young people, she really showed even then uh, how much she had enjoyed uh, her evening. So uh, I end by 
also wishing to convey my condolences uh, to her family, uh, the loss of a mother, no matter uh, who or what or what age, is always a harrowing thing. And I think uh, to the, the country as a whole who has lost, I repeat, its greatest figure in my lifetime. Okay. I would like to, to extend my condolences to the family of um, uh, Lady Thatcher. Um, and uh, I hope the message which will come from this debate to them will be simply of the sheer greatness of their mother and their grandmother. My Lord, shortly after um, Margaret Thatcher retired uh, as Prime Minister, there was a meeting of the ACP uh, to decide uh, how her retirement was going to be marked. There was considerable navel-gazing, uh, but in the end, Lord Boyden Carpenter was deputed to organize a dinner for her and Dennis at the Cavalry Club. Now I had only recently arrived in your Lordship's house and we were mixed up uh, career-wise and age-wise and it was a very jolly event. At the end of the dinner, Humphrey Colmbrook, the then chairman of um, the ACP, got up and said, Margaret, this is not a time, uh, a time for speeches uh, this evening. I'm just going to say one thing. You took over the leadership of our party at the time when this country was sinking, giggling beneath the waves. And your abiding achievement as Prime Minister is that you restored its self-respect. Now, this was a time, and he sat down. Now, this was a time when uh, it was a fraught time for Margaret. And uh, uh, even a weepy time, as many of her colleagues at that time who have spoken today will testify. We need not have worried. It turned out to be a wholly absorbing overview, uh, a tour de force of her achievements as Prime Minister, month by month, week by week, sometimes even hour by hour. And she finished with the following sentence. My Lords, may I leave you with fun one final thought. The destiny of this country is inextricably bound up with that of the United States of America. My Lords, this has been a most amazing debate, but I felt absolutely compelled to say a few words as one who speaks of being, in a sense, of the next generation. I wasn't lucky enough, as many of you who have spoken today, to have worked with her, but I did know her just a little bit and she had a profound effect upon me and my generation, both men and women. So if I can share with you a little bit of a, a more distant perspective for a few moments. In 1979, I was in my mid-twenties, a young barrister, having some fun with friends and so on, but we just felt the country was broke. The outlook was bleak. Mass inflation, unemployment, terrible apathy as the rubbish piled up around us and the strikes continued. The straw that broke the camel's back for me was my father was mugged in broad daylight in St. James's Park. He was smashed for head, legs. No one came for hours. When someone finally came, they took him to Westminster Hospital. Westminster refused to even look at him because they were on strike. He was then taken to Chelsea Hospital and they looked at him in a cursory way and then let him go home. He couldn't go back to work because his legs wouldn't work but also he was embarrassed because his teeth had been smashed and so he called the dentist. The dentist took one look at him and saw, saw that his whole head had been completely smashed and no one had noticed because they were on strike. So my Lord, soon after that, thank God, the Conservatives won the election. But my husband and I, as newly weds, left for better climes to New York to work. And it was amazing to have the perspective from New York as we saw from 3,000 miles away this country turn around mm -hmm. and her reputation grow exponentially in such a short space of time. It was extraordinary. And we slightly felt we were missing something by working in New York. And the Falklands 
uh, that was extraordinary. The Americans were sort of envious of, this, of us having this courageous woman as our leader. And they would say, God, you're lucky having that person. And what leadership? And of course, business, men and women around the world, as others have said today, and my noble friend, Lord, Lord Flight, has, has just mentioned, what a, what a difference she has made in the business world. And I've just returned from a, a parliamentary delegation uh, to India, parliamentary uh, Commonwealth delegation to India, and still business men and women coming up to me in particular, and politicians there saying how, how brilliant she was. Just a few brief memories as someone who was lucky enough to come into your Lordship's house. First of all, before she gave me, she emboldened me to stand for Parliament. Sadly, I didn't win, but I remember it was a moment when I returned from America. I was jet-lagged, I was in my car, I probably shouldn't have been driving, and on came Prime Minister's question time. And she just flown in from an overnight flight from Japan. And she was amazing. And I thought, if she can do it, so can I. So please, all this nonsense about her not helping other women. She was the ultimate role model. And she would have said to all of us, and she would say to me, she did say to me, women can achieve, women can get there. But of course, she wanted us to achieve on merit. I remember when I first came into your Lordship's house, I went to her for advice and I said, Margaret, I don't understand this. What's the point of making a maiden speech unless you can say something that's worth saying? I mean, all this business, you can't be controversial. She said, Peter, you mustn't be controversial, but what you must do is stand up for what you believe. And the other thing she said to me, which I think I've heard already this evening, never start anything unless you're prepared to see it through. A few years on, one evening in your Lordship's house, I was dividing the house seven times on the licensing bill, and I was determined and did win seven times. But others were slightly nudging me, saying, Peter, when is this going to end? Margaret Thatcher has a party, and she's here, and she's missing her own party. So I went up to her, and I said, I'm so sorry, Margaret, but it's so, I'm so glad you're here supporting my amendments. And she said, my dear, it's marvellous. I'm really enjoying myself. This is just like old times. So this was her priority. It was her country uh, and her belief in this nation. So my lords, just a few thoughts that I wanted to share with you. And just being here today, taking part in these tributes to Margaret Thatcher is an enormous privilege. She was a truly extraordinary, remarkable lady and she will, in many ways, remain with us always. We've heard many powerful and moving tributes this afternoon from all sides of the House. We've heard many examples of how Margaret Thatcher touched the lives of so many in your Lordship's House, both in public and in private life. I think the Noble Lords have added a lot to our understanding of this remarkable woman, and that there's been a lot of new material for historians to mine. We're all fortunate to have been here, as it's been a great parliamentary occasion for a great parliamentarian. But above all, my lords, I hope that Lady Thatcher's family will have the chance to read the tributes that have been made uh, this afternoon about their mother and their grandmother and all that she did and feel very proud uh, of what she achieved. My lords, I beg to move that the House be now adjourned. That the House to do adjourn.